welcome everybody to the second of our special mini lecture series on the Nabataeans. Uh, last night we were treated to a fascinating introduction to these somewhat mysterious people and I'm sure that many of you are keen to move on to the next instalment. First though I would like to introduce our lecturer to any newcomers this evening, Dr Christopher Tuttle. ASA travellers who have been on tour with Chris have enjoyed his extraordinary knowledge from the most ancient of ruins to spectacular crusader castles. Importantly, he has a marvellous ability to bring each of these places to life by reading the archaeology and using it to tell the story of the people who lived there. As we know, he is an authority on the Nabataeans, but he's also studied many other civilizations of the ancient Mediterranean world and any interactions that they may have had with each other. The Lycians of Turkey's turquoise coast, the only other peoples in the region who created rock cartoons like we're going to see tonight, the Phoenicians and Carthaginians of North Africa, the different Greek city-states and their colonies in Magna Graecia, the Nuragic peoples in Neolithic Sardinia, and of course the mighty Romans who top my list of favourite ancient conquerors. This evening, Chris will continue the tale of the Nabataeans, taking us to their cities in Jordan and a little step over into Saudi Arabia with his lecture, The Nabataeans, Masters of Water and Trade. Thanks, Chris. All right. Hi, folks. Thanks to everybody who has returned for the second night, who was here last night. And for those of you who might have missed last night's talk, I'm going to do a very quick summary of some of the main points that we gleaned from the talk. So for my part one, a historical overview of who, where, and when, we discussed how the Nabataeans existed as a distinct sociopolitical identity from at least 312 BCE, but we still don't know to this day for certain where they came from. We also know they adopted a Neo-Hellenistic style kingship as early as 170 BCE, perhaps as early as 270 BCE, and that they were able to form their kingdom and come to power because of the wars between Alexander the Great's generals, the Seleucids, the Ptolemies, the Antigonids, who warred for over 250, 275 years and eventually weakened themselves so much that these independent kingdoms were able to carve out areas for themselves. The Nabataeans that we're going to talk about and the Hasmonean kingdom in Judea to the west are two examples. The territory that the kingdom of the Nabataeans grew to encompass ranged all the way to the north, one point as far as Damascus, and as far south as into the northwestern part of Saudi Arabia, and all the way to the west uh, to encompass the entire Sinai Peninsula. This territory sat on top of all of the most important Arabian overland trade routes, except those that went through Palmyra in the northern part of Syria. The kingdom lasted for about 275 years, and they, in the end, were the last of these independent kingdoms to give in to Rome. So without further ado, we're going to move on to tonight's topic, which is about how they came to power because of their mastery of water in the desert and of and controlling all of the overland trade. So here are two maps. The one on the left shows the extent of the Nabataean kingdom, mostly at its height. And if you were to just visually slide that over on top of the map to the right, you'll see that this area here is what we're talking about. It's right where the confluence of all those overland trade routes came about. That is not by chance. All right, so we're going to start with talking about their mastery of water. And I mentioned what one of our main literary sources for the Nabataeans is Diodorus Siculus, a historian writing in the first century BC, but he's drawing on sources from people who were part of those Diadochoi wars. And he's describing the Nabataeans in the year 312 to 311 BCE. And one of the things he tells us is that they are exceptionally fond of freedom. And whenever a strong force of enemies come, they take refuge in the desert, using this as a fortress, for it lacks water and cannot be crossed by others, but to them alone, since they have prepared subterranean reservoirs lined with stucco, it furnishes safety. So here I'm showing you two of these examples that we have found. 
where they built these giant reservoirs underground, roofed them with these arches. Incidentally, those simple arches there without a keystone, those are called uh, Nabataean arches, and they predate the Romans' uh, keystone arches. But these were all throughout the kingdom, and there are probably hundreds, if not thousands of them out there we still haven't found. So it's one of the ways that they secured water. So they could go into parts of the desert uh, and survive and take herds there, take caravans through, because they knew where these hidden caches of water were. They also carved massive cisterns. Uh, so here on the left, one near Petra in that uh, region called Beda, or Little Petra is what people often refer to it as, on the left. And the same... The one on the right is also at Beda. It's even bigger. The one on the right held somewhere close to like 750,000 liters of water at capacity. It's huge. And there are dozens, I mean, probably hundreds that we don't even know about. But altogether, they had the ability to store millions of liters of water. Now, where did the water come from? Obviously, they used any permanent springs, such as the one on the left, where you can see all the oleander blooming there in the valley. That's one near Petra. Actually, all three of these are at Petra. But the other two that they, the other type of spring that they would harness would be what we call seepage springs. And these, they result from the seasonal rains. Uh, the sandstone that these mountains are made of is very porous, and there's lots of cracks and water during the rainy season, works its way inside the stone, and then leaches its way out as a seepage spring throughout the year. But the other thing that they were just truly masters of is observation and learning how to use what they saw. So throughout their entire territory, they learned the terrain they learned what the weather outcomes were. So when it rained, if it only rained up on those mountains over there, where did the water then come? And they would modify the terrain to direct that water to where they wanted it to be. And here in the middle photo is a natural rain runoff. And they simply carved a cistern at the bottom of it. In the photo on the right, they had to carve channels to then direct that water into cistern because it wouldn't naturally flow off the mountain the way that they wanted it. So they covered the mountains with various channels and things that looked like stairs to then direct the water where they wanted it. And they did this, by doing this, they harvested and stored all the seasonal rains that they could capture. And it, it's fascinating to think about the modern Jordan, <laughs> where much of this territory is, doesn't do any of that. If they did, their water situation would be a lot better than it is today. But the other thing that the Nabataeans did is they developed technologies to move the water around from those storage areas. And down in the lower left, you'll see this lovely little confluence of nested pipes. Uh, they're ceramic pipes, and they laid them in the cliffs and all throughout to be able to move the water around. And they even knew how to make water go uphill, which is pretty astounding. And they would do that by building a series of tanks and then having pipes coming out from the bottom of the tanks. And they would be able to use the pressure, the gravity weight of the water in the tanks to push the water out and move it to wherever they wanted to go. They truly were masters of water. Here on the top two photos, you can see this is the Sikh, the monumental entryway through the gorge into Petra. And if you look on the left side of the Sikh here and on the right side of the Sikh, these are carved channels in which they fit these nested pipes and were able to draw water from, in this case, they're pulling water from large cisterns that are more than three kilometers away before it even enters these pipes in the Seek. And then these pipes lead into the city center, which is another two and a half kilometers away. Really ingenious amount of engineering. So that's pretty much all I wanna talk about for water because I have a lot to cover tonight, but I wanna just leave you with that understanding of they really knew how to use the landscape around them to harness the water that they needed.
the bigger part I want to talk about tonight is the trade, because one of the reasons that the Nabataeans rose to such prominence for the 275 years of their kingdom was the wealth that they had. They truly, truly were wealthy. So I want to start here again with a quote from Diodorus Siculus, describing as far back as 312 BC. The Nabataeans far surpass any other Arab groups in wealth. Although they are not more than 10,000 in number, for not a few of them bring down to the sea frankincense and myrrh and the valuable kinds of spices. And that's a real key here to understanding why the trade could be so lucrative, even though the ability to carry out the trade on scales large enough to raise the wealth involved massive logistical problems. We're talking about moving goods from what is today Oman, Yemen, all the way across the Arabian Peninsula. And that is not a small mass land mass. And then getting it to Petra and from Petra transshipping it onto the Mediterranean or other points. So my question here is portable, high-end luxury items, anyone? Because that's really what we're going to have to be talking about to get to the level of wealth that the Nabataeans had. So how did all this trade work? I've shown this map a couple of times on the left. This is showing the little red lines are the major trade routes at the time of the Roman Empire. So it's a little misleading for the kingdom, but we don't have any, I haven't been able to find a really good map that doesn't include these sea routes. But it's important to note that prior to 125 BC or thereabouts, the Red Sea was not considered navigable. It has very complicated currents and tides and very troubling winds. So people did not actually use the Red Sea until about 125 BC, other than to maybe coast along. But to really sail across the sea or up the middle of the sea didn't happen until after they figured all of that out. And same is true between for the routes here shown between the southern end of what is today Yemen and the coast of India, especially down he, this region down here. They were doing it early, but they would have to hug the coast. And they would come up here, and then they would come across this little gap and come into the landmass here or at Gera. So when we're talking about overland trade prior to about 125 BC, we are really talking about overland trade. And that is what dominated the uh, Arabian Peninsula for millennia. The Nabataeans were just the last in a very long series of kingdoms throughout the Arabian Peninsula and the area around the Dead Sea and Transjordan uh, who controlled these trade routes. So the Nabataeans eventually supplanted somebody else for, for this control. What were they bringing? Well, everyone probably has heard about the incense from South Arabia. And so, of course, we're talking about frankincense, which is on the top there, the golden resin. And I've shown you there in the middle an example of the tree and even an example of what the sap looks like before it's harvested and hardens into the resin. On the bottom, same thing, only this time it's myrrh. And these were two massively lucrative staple goods during the entire history of these overland trade routes for thousands of years. And by the time Rome began to rise, even during the latter years of the Roman Republic, and definitely during the Roman Empire, they burned tons of this stuff. And so it was a very, very lucrative product. It was bulkier than some of the material that we're going to talk about. They still would have had to bring a lot of it on beasts of burden. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But it's really not clear how they did it. Everyone assumes camel caravans. And I could do a whole lecture on whether or not it really could have been camel caravans alone. But just imagine the amount of effort it would take if one sack of this, say, weighed 50 kilos and you need to get tons of it to multiple cities in the Mediterranean world. 
somebody's carrying a lot of this stuff. And here I want to talk about the geography just a little bit, because this is very important. You see this dark shadow where I'm making a kind of an oval here on the southwest side of the Red Sea in what is Nubia, Ethiopia, and that part of Eastern Africa, and all the way along here. This is all part of a geological formation known as the Arabian Nubian Shield. And it results from the tectonic movement between the Africa plate, the Arabian plate, and ultimately these other plates off here that lead down into the Indian subcontinent. But the key point here is that this eastern part of eastern Africa is actually separating from the main African plate, and it is slowly submerging beneath the Arabian plate. And so all of this dark area is actually uplift from the shifting of the tectonic plates. Interestingly enough, over here in what's called the Arabian Gulf or the Persian Gulf, this is actually getting shallower over geologic time because the Arabian plate, think of it as actually kind of tilting in that direction. So what does that all mean? This movement has brought up an enormous amount of different types of minerals. And it's been harvested and mined for thousands of years. And a lot of what they're looking for are different types of gemstones. And specifically, you can harvest amazonite from there. You can harvest turquoise. You get emeralds, peridots, and malachite as well down here on the right. I've included here as carnelian and lapis lazuli, which did not come from this Arabian Nubian plate, but rather had to be transshipped from Central Asia or India. But they definitely were coming in on the trade route. So we're talking very small quantities comparatively and small weight, but very high-end, very expensive luxury goods. This is also true for indigo and Indian cotton and perhaps Indian silk, although that's not as certain. But I love this story about indigo because indigo actually comes from the Latin word for it. And the Romans actually thought that indigo was a mineral because they would see it in these block forms, didn't realizing that this was actually a precipitant from soaking the indigo leaves and then heating it and then, you know, collecting up the sludge at the bottom and turning it into bricks that could then be transshipped somewhere else. But the other thing that people often forget about is cotton was not ubiquitous in the ancient world. It pretty much at this point in time only came from India and it was almost as valuable as silk in the sense that it didn't cost as much but it was in even higher demand because it was more affordable than silk. So again, not super heavy, but very high-end ingredients. Then, of course, we had would have had the spices. And much of this is coming, if you remember that trade map with the sea routes, most of them are coming to this section of India subcontinent. It's called the Malabar Coast. And it was super important in the entire history of spices moving from the east to the west. At the time of the Roman world, so that's contemporary with the Nabataean kingdom, but we don't have sources for the Nabataeans themselves, but we do have sources that talk about what Rome used in the Republic as well as the empire. And they were cinnamon, cardamom, cloves, ginger, vanilla, and peppercorns. And if you've jumped ahead of me here and read the text, pepper was very, 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 very valuable in Rome. Pliny the Elder, writing in 77 CE, reports that the demand for pepper was bleeding more than 50 million sestertia away from Rome each year. That's about 545 million U.S. dollars in value today. And that's per year just for pepper. And the Nabataeans controlled all of that trade. So money was coming in. So what did the Nabataeans do with all this money? Well, I'm going to start at the end of their trade story because I want to include Hegra or Medellin Saleh, 
which is right down here in northwest Saudi Arabia at the edge of the Hejaz. And it was the southernmost urban center uh, that the Nabataeans ever had. And it was built as a whole cloth at the beginning of the first century AD. And it was built to really try to put a physical presence of the Nabataeans at this important point on these overland trade routes to secure them. Because by this time, the beginning of the first century CE or AD, the Romans were beginning to divert trade. This is after 125 BC, so people are now navigating the Red Sea more efficiently. They were trying to divert that trade over here to the Egyptian coast because they didn't want to have to pay the taxes. So they built this city. It was, and this is kind of the extent of the city right here. And then all of these cliffs around it were, they built tombs. It was effective for about a hundred years, not quite to a point, but eventually the Romans just diverted the trade away uh, by ship to the Egyptian coast and Medellin Sala or ancient Hegra really became irrelevant and diminished over the next couple of centuries dramatically. But it was found in the first 25 years of the first century CE and began to really die out a hundred years later. And I wanted to show, this is what you see when you visit today. It was rapidly built city. They made the foundations out of stone, but everything else would have been mud brick. And there just really isn't much there today. And the only reason we can see what's here in the lower right-hand photo is because it's part of an, an active excavation. It's now been backfilled. So if you go to the site today, you don't even get to see that. But I wanted to include this because it is an important part of the story of they actually spent the money to build an entire city in an attempt to maintain control of the trade to have more money come in. So when you go there today, you really go there to see these. There are several hundred of them and they're exquisite. The sandstone is a harder sandstone than what we have in Petra and the details haven't eroded away as much. And they really are spectacular to see. So these are classic Nabataean tombs, Nabataean capitals, but also blending eagles and rosettes and elements from other traditions. And I wish I had time to give you a talk about these monumental crow steps, but that really would take another whole hour itself just to talk about this one design that you're going to see a lot on Nabataean tombs. But that is just a glimpse of Hegra in Northwest Saudi Arabia. So I want to do now is take you to Petra and give you a virtual tour of Petra because nearly everything you see in Petra today and all the stuff in all these areas that aren't even excavated yet was paid for by this trade well and was sustained in the desert by the mastery of water. It is estimated that at its height, this city housed about 30,000 people and it is bone dry. So unless you had all of that captured and reserved water, it would not have been possible. So Petra is possibly been a base for the Nabataeans as far back as the fourth century. That story I told yesterday about the the site where the general from Antigonus came and raided, and that's where Diodorus Siculus first talks to us about the Nabataeans. It is thought that it is this valley of Petra that is being described. But as I said, most of what you see today is from much later. It, nothing has really been found from that early to show that there was any urbanization happening here. There are some fragments to suggest that there were smaller grand buildings, like small temples and maybe some houses and some other civic buildings that was here as early as the second to the first century BCE. But they're very scattered and we don't know much about them because the whole thing was just torn apart and rebuilt in the first century BCE to second century CE up at the till the time of the Roman annexation. The monumental elaborate buildings, why were they spending the money to do this? The ethos of the time 
and all of the kingdoms did this. Power and status in the late Hellenistic and Roman periods was expressed through monumental, elaborate buildings and complex cities. It was very richly decorated uh, cities. So that was part of why they, they were spending all this wealth on cities. All right, so let's take a virtual walk into the city center because I promised you all monuments and so we're gonna see them and see how the Nabataean gold was spent. So here is just a map that shows how much stuff, and this is an old map, there's more stuff, but nobody's come out with an updated map recently. And way over here is where you enter, where it says gate ticket office. And then you walk through this valley to this dam. And that's about, it's 1.5 miles, basically from up here to there. And no, I'm sorry, 1.5 kilometers. Then you here you get to here and you enter the seek and you walk all the way down here till you get to the start of the actual city center. And that is about four and a half kilometers. So it's a long way. And we're gonna walk that virtually now. The whole area here, by the way, is about I think it's about 10 square kilometers. And when you start to move out here and more into the hinterland, we're talking huge, huge areas. I mean, uh, it's 263 square miles, I believe. All right. So when you're headed down that outer valley, uh, the very first things you see are monumental tombs. This one right in the foreground here is one of the oldest type that we have. It's called a gin block. And... And the names I'm going to be giving for a lot of these monuments are late Bedouin 18th, 19th century names. They don't necessarily reflect what the function of the building was when the Nabataeans made it. But this block uh, is a tomb, and the tomb would have actually been up here. It's fallen away and eroded now. And then later, there was actually a another tomb cut into the bottom of it. But these were made by carving the mountain away from the central block massive amount of work uh and they clearly at some point decided we can't do this for every tomb so they begin to morph them into these two-dimensional facades and across the way here we have a very famous tomb called the obelisk tomb and here is where the tomb is in the upper portion down here is actually the associated triclinium where you would go periodically and and feast with your ancestors so Everything you're going to see for the next 12 slides or so, think of it as walking down the Appian Way into Rome or some other city. You're to be impressed by the grandeur of our ancestral history. And it took a lot of wealth and resources to make all these monuments. So we now head from there to the entrance of the Sikh. And I've showed this last night. This is that drawing by Lady Louisa Tennyson to show the arch here that originally spanned the opening to the natural gorge and there's what's left of it right there i'd said last night how we could never rebuild it because the original stones were washed away in flooding and we proceed down that valley and here's again some of those places where there are water channels moving water and one of the things you see as you go through is this little shrine carved into a block that fell off the mountain you know however many millennia ago and they carved this shrine and here's one of those eye betels we talked about last night thought to be the goddess el Uzza. and here a slightly smaller plain betel thought to be the god dushar and i've always loved that she's bigger than him then you continue down the Seek, and that's about 1.2 kilometers. And then you come to this, and you begin to see the monument that everybody wants to see, the so-called treasury. And you get this partial glimpse, and then you get a bigger portion of it. And then you walk out into the plaza, and you can see it in all of its glory. And I've included an image here from when they do this little event every week of uh, Petra by Night to show what it looks like in, in just lantern light. But this is a tomb. It's called in the Bedouin, the treasury. And that's got a long story about how they thought it was made by the Pharaoh of Egypt and that the gold of Pharaoh was stored up here at the top. But it really was a tomb, a royal tomb. And we know that it was actually constructed about 25 BCE because 
a number of years ago, actually almost a decade and a half ago now, they excavated right here in front of it and we were able to get material that helped us date when the facade was carved. From the treasury, which is the iconic image of Petra, we head in toward the city center and we pass just dozens and dozens and dozens of these massive tombs. Again, here are those crow steps that I, I would love to talk to you about sometime. And you can see how they've gone from three dimensional blocks carved completely out of the mountain, morphing that into a two dimensional facade that maintains the same sort of shape, tapering slightly toward the top and whatnot. And at this point, we've walked over two kilometers since the beginning of the Seek, and we're still on the entry road, that monumental entryway that is supposed to impress you as you come to the city. Ultimately, it's going to be about four and a half kilometers or two and a half miles to walk from the beginning until you get to where the city center actually starts. The next major monument you see as you're going in is this theater. It's a Greek style theater. And by that, I mean, it's carved into the mountainside rather than being built on freestanding buttressing arches like the Romans would eventually do when they started to build stone theaters because they had figured out the keystone arch by then. But the Greeks hadn't, didn't have that technology and they did it all by carving it into mountainsides. This is one of the largest theaters in the region. And I've included some of these restoration so people get a better sense of what they would have looked like. This theater seated about 8,500 people at its maximum. And it was built in two phases. Originally, it was an open, just a stage down here and a smaller caveat. And in the early second century, they built a more Roman style gain of fronds and expanded to add more seats. From the theater, which is really the first civic a monument you see, although it's not technically in the city center yet, it's still along this monumental entranceway. So it's actually surrounded by tombs. And these openings that you see up and back here were in fact tombs that were destroyed in order to make the theater expansion. So when the theater was first made, there would have been tombs up here. And there's no other culture in the region that mixed the living and the dead quite the way that the Nabataeans did. Here we get a glimpse of some of the royal tombs. And this is as if you're, this is seen from standing on the side of the colonnaded street and looking toward the east. And the point I wanted to make here is just what I just made. It's very unusual to mix the living and the dead. But here in the Nabataean world, they had a very close relationship with their ancestors. So here are some of the royal tombs, and you actually see them all the time from the city center. This one's rather spectacular. It's missing the constructed portion up here on the left, where which has collapsed during er because of erosion and earthquakes. But the cliff wasn't big enough to actually make it what they wanted, so they had to actually construct part of it. Here we move on to a map because I want you to get a sense of what you're looking at. So we were just standing right here looking back to the east at the royal tombs. But all of that area was not yet really in the city center. The city center starts right about where my mouse is moving. And the first monument that one sees as you enter any sort of city from the early Roman, that's emulating the early Roman and late Hellenistic cultures, is a nymphaeum and that's right there what's a nymphaeum it's a monument to the local nature spirits and that focuses on water uh actually it's coming up in a moment i wanted to give you another shot because we were standing right there looking back at the tombs and then here's the colonnaded street and the major civic buildings in the center of the town and I mentioned earlier, everything that you see today is largely built during the height of the kingdom between like say 50 BC and 50 CE or, or 100 CE. The exceptions that you see when you visit today are the Christian churches. They were built in the late fourth century to sixth centuries. We're not gonna cover them today because they're well after the independent kingdom has ceased to exist. Here's that nymphaeum, and this is all that you see today, but we have this lovely pistachio tree whose roots go down to the cistern beneath it, and it still thrives. It's hundreds of years old, and it still produces fruit. 
And again, here's one of those um, artists rendering of a restoration of what it, what it would have looked like in its heyday. Now, from that, you then turn to the west and you head into the city proper. So right there's that pistachio tree and the royal tomb. So we're looking east now, back down the colonnaded street. But if you turned and looked to the west toward the main temple of the city, you this is what it approximately would have looked like in antiquity. These would have been shops underneath the colonnades. And then this gate separated the mundane part of the civic center from the holy part of the city center. And where we are, right, there's that gate right there. There's that nymphaeum there. And this is the colonnaded street that would have had the shops. Now we're going to turn our attention to this big area here. It's called the South Terrace. And the only thing that's been excavated here are these two areas. So we're going to look at this and a little bit of this uh, it, only in a drawing, though, because there's not much to show in terms of photography. So this monument here is called the Petrograde Temple. And as I mentioned earlier, pay no attention to the function and the names. Uh, it was called the Great Temple because the, some of the very first people to come in and document this site thought it was a temple because they saw these massive columns lying on the ground. You can see two of them still in place right here and thought it must be a temple. Today, we realize it's much more likely a civic building, probably the Royal Audience Hall, where the king and his court would have held audience for political reasons. It was later adapted in the second century uh, Roman period, and this little theater was inserted into the center of the building. And it's debated, but many of us think that this is where the Council of Elders for the town during the Roman period, the Boule, would have met. And there's good circumstantial evidence to suggest that's the case because the Roman Emperor Hadrian did a progress through the region in during his reign, about 136 CE, and he was a Philhellenic person. He even had the title Philhellene, meaning lover of the Greeks. And he loved the East, and he granted quite a number of cities in the East the independent governance under the empire, but they could make decisions on their own. And he reestablished the boules and allowed them to build these small buildings with little theaters for the boule to meet, and we call those bouleteria. And I think that's what we're looking at here. Off to the left next to it is a partially excavated area. And you can just see a little bit here in the middle, which is part of a pavilion that sat on an island, colonnades in front of that great temple building are unique because every one of the 400 and something columns had four elephant heads on the corners of all the capitals. This is unique to the Nabataeans. We have two examples of them replacing the typical finials and acanthus leaves of a Corinthian column with these elephant heads. In this case, it was elephants and they were Asian elephants. Uh, we're going to see another building shortly where they did the same thing, but it was a different animal that they used. And there aren't many of these that have been preserved, but imagine walking into this big area right here, surrounded by these columns with hundreds of elephants looking down on you. But connected to this complex was a pool and garden complex. And here's that little island with a pavilion on it. And there was this very well laid landscaped garden that you could walk through and then cross these little bridges out onto the pavilion. And this was the size of an Olympic swimming pool. Whether or not they swam in it, we don't know, but um, it was fed by a structure up here that was a huge reservoir with water that was piped in from about 10 kilometers away to keep that pool full. So that was an extraordinary uh, complex in its day. And again, that's what we were looking at just here. The other main buildings in the city center are this building here that we're gonna visit next. It's the temple of the main god, Dushara. Uh, 
And then we're going to take a look at this building up here, which is the temple to the main goddess, Aloza. There are likely many other temples in the area that have that we've not discovered yet, or we'll eventually only find traces of them because maybe some of the churches were built on top of them. But we know that there's at least one here, and that's this little building here. I'm not going to show it to you because there's really nothing to see today. But it was a small temple that was built to the cult of the Roman emperor somewhere in the second century CE, late first century, maybe when it was still Nabataean kingdom. It's, it's not at all clear on um, what the dating of it is. But here's that main Dushara temple today called the Qasr al-Bint al-Fahrun, meaning the castle of the daughter of Pharaoh. Uh, but of course, it really had nothing to do with Pharaoh or his daughter. It was the temple to the main god Dushara. And he, here's another example of one of these restorations to give you an idea of what it would have looked like in its grandeur. Then turning across that street, across the main valley, to the Temple of the Winged Lions. This is the main temple to the main goddess, Aluza. And this is what it would have looked like in its heyday. And these columns, just to give you an idea, are about a meter 0.75 in diameter. And they were gigantic. They were just Corinthian style columns. But when you went inside the temple, you had this area here, which was a small podium surrounded by still more columns. And the corners of all of these capitals were winged lion. Unfortunately, none of the capitals survive in their entirety. So all we have are some fragments. Sadly, the original excavator of this monument buried two almost intact ones somewhere on the site, but we never found them. When we went back to the site in 2011 and 2012, I ran a project to restore this building to keep it from collapsing and to redocument everything because it was a very poorly done excavation and it was never published. And we spent weeks and weeks and weeks trying to find where he buried those capitals. And we never succeeded in finding it, even though we did locate some of the original workmen amongst the Bedouin who had excavated and participated in burying the capitals, but they couldn't remember where they were. So they're still out there to be found for the future. Back to our main map here, uh, because we're, we're now going to leave the city center. So we were just looking at the monuments right here. We're gonna go off on one of these side valleys. There are many that lead out of the Central Valley and they're all full of tombs. There are well over 800 tombs that are facade tombs inside the Petra Valley. And then there are tens of thousands of simple shaft graves and other types of burials that we don't, I won't even talk about. But we're gonna go visit one monument that is not a tomb. And it's a long climb, it's about a thousand stairs up to the top of this mountain up here. And there it is, it's called the monastery. And here you can see it in the distance from the top of another mountain. You can just make out the top of the monument there. And again, it, it isn't a monastery. The, the Arabic word used by the Bedouins, adair, simply means the monastery. But exactly what it was, we're not sure. It is probably a cultic temple. There might have been a burial in there at some point, but I don't think there was. What many of us think is that it's a cenotaph. It's a false burial for a king, Obadas I, who was killed away from Petra during the first part of the first century BC. He died over in the Negev Desert in what is today southern Israel and part of Palestine. And a cult grew up around him about 100 years later. And this is about the time this monument was carved, and we think it may be dedicated to him. And we've got some inscriptions that even mention him in nearby to it. And so it is a fascinating facade. I wish I had time to pull this and the treasury up side by side and go into it. But next time you look at images of this, note all the figural carving on the treasury, all of the plants and the 
and the decorations that are very Greek, very Roman, very Hellenistic and Roman and not native. This one has none of that. All of the capitals are the unique Nabataean capitals. All of the decorations are simple and plain and geometric. It is a gigantic representation of the aniconic tradition I mentioned yesterday of representing deities without human characteristics or features or anything like that. And just to give you a little bit of idea of scale, this right here uh, that sits on the top, that's me sitting on the edge of it watching the sunset right there many years ago when it was actually not forbidden to climb up there. <laughs> it, you can't do that now and nor should you. But um, it is a great photo that a friend of mine took, so I've included it. And that brings me to the end of my talk today. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you've learned a bit about the Nabataeans. Thank you, Chris. We do have time for some questions if anybody would like to unmute and ask Chris a question. I have a question. Yes. Uh, how much of this do we actually walk of the paths that you talked about tonight? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, one can walk it all, which would be about four and a half kilometers. Then you have to turn around and come back. So it's a very long walking day. If you do the Fitbit thing, we all get a lot of steps in on that day. But they now have electric golf cart type things <laughs> that can be hired to drive people in through the sea. And, and, it, and it has made the site more accessible for people. It is a lot of walking. And you're going downhill from the entrance of the Sikh until you get to the city center. It's not obvious, but you do notice it when you're coming back out after the long day. It, it's very clear from the images you've shown us that the site is incredibly dry and bleak today and very little seems to grow there apart from the pistachio tree. Um, so I wonder, was it as dry in the era that the <sighs> Nabataeans lived there? And how did they grow enough food for themselves to maintain their themselves on a daily basis? Okay, two-part question. Yes, it was. The climate was not substantially different than it is today. The difference was water management. They were, a, there were lots of gardens and people would have had uh, produce gardens and herb gardens uh, in their houses. Like we didn't even talk about the houses today because I just didn't have time to get everything in. There was about 30,000 people there and they did not lack for water like they do today. The Bedouin really suffer the ones who live there. How did they supply the city? This is one of our commodities questions that we don't have a good answer. We generally believe that a lot of that wealth was also spent on alimenting the city. So I, I believe a lot of the foodstuffs would have been brought in. Now, the hinterland outside the valley has areas that are really, even today, agriculturally productive, utilizing just the winter rains, not necessarily even having to do artificial irrigation. But 30,000 people is a lot of people. So we still have questions on the alimentation of the city. Mm, thank you. You're welcome. Could you just tell me when they build these tombs, do they build them from the top down or from the bottom up? I love this lady already. An amazingly good question, and I wish I'd included a photo for you. They carved them from the top down. Top down. Uh, so they would use a series of rope-suspended uh, platforms. Maybe they did use scaffolding as well, because we have holes that are drilled into the sandstone where most likely was to support uh, scaffolding. Yeah. Where I hesitate on that is we don't know when those holes were drilled. Were they original to the construction or were they added later for some other purpose? We don't know. But yes, we have unfinished tombs where they, they only carved the first meter or two and then the person died prematurely and they carved a little grave in the front of the, of the portion they had finished, stuck them in, sealed them in, and never finished the rest of the tomb. Thank you Great very much. Great question. Thank you. Don't have an archaeological background at all. 
you did say yesterday that they didn't have any literature of their own. And I'm just wondering whether they were written up by those who did have written records. And if they were, did they say anything more than these were very wealthy traders? Okay. The, the answer is we don't have any of the literature, anything in their own, much of anything in their own voice. Not to say they didn't have it, it just hasn't been preserved or we haven't found it yet. And a little qualification there is papyrus would have been the predominant way that they would have recorded things. And unlike the sands of dry Egypt, where papyrus is often well preserved, this is surprisingly moist for being very dry. And papyrus, if it's buried and doesn't survive. So it's, we just don't know that, we don't know that they didn't have it. We just don't have it. So absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And we do have almost everything written about the Nabataeans is by someone else. And so mm -hmm. I mentioned some of those sources yesterday. The primary ones are Diodorus Siculus, Strabo the geographer, Flavius Josephus, the, uh, the Jewish Roman historian. Additionally, they're mentioned in 2 Maccabees in the New Testament. And the Xenon papyri I showed yesterday mentions them. And then there are about probably two to three dozen other classical and post-classical writers who mentioned them. But those people we don't consider as good of sources because they're already ref using somebody else like Diodorus Siculus or Strabo or something like that. So mm. that's kind of where our, our literary sources are, are limited to. Mm. Sorry. Would you mind explaining what the Petra scrolls are and where they were found, please? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I didn't cover them today because they're they're Byzantine. They're from the Christian period, and it just wasn't time to talk about the churches <laughs> and the onset of Christianity in Petra specifically and amongst the Nabataeans. Okay, so the the main cathedral that you didn't see tonight, there is an excavated cathedral in Petra. We were just call it the Petra Church or the Mosaic Church, and it has beautifully preserved mosaics. In a back corner of this church, there's a couple of side rooms, and in one of them, well, let me take a step back for a second. Somewhere around 600 AD, the church caught fire and burnt and collapsed, which is one of the reasons we have the mosaics, because they weren't visible at the time of the Islamic prescriptions that caused a lot of other mosaics in the regions to be destroyed or discombobulated. These were preserved intact because they were buried under the rubble. In one of those back rooms, there was a number of shelves with papyrus scrolls. And during the fire, they, they caught fire, but before they burned to ash, the building collapsed on top of them, sealing out the air. So they simply smoldered and turned to charcoal. During the excavation of the church, those scrolls were found, and we were able to unroll them in small broken strips. And then they were able, they were sealed between glass plates and were able to be read using various technologies. And this goes back to the 90s. So nowhere near the types of technologies we have today. Like it's in the news right now, they're just opened some uh, burnt papyri from Pompeii, which to do that now in 2024 isn't all that amazing. But when they did this in 1995, it was an extraordinary accomplishment. And we've learned a lot about what happened to Petra after the big earthquake of 363, which destroyed a lot of the city, even before the Byzantine churches were built and stuff like that. Yes, thanks, Kristen. That's a great question. We will visit and see some of those actual burnt papyri on the tour when we go to Jordan, because they're housed at the center I used to work for, the American Center of Research. We really appreciate it. We appreciate it. Well, you're most welcome. I, I've enjoyed it immensely. What I covered yesterday and today is just a piece of this. <laughs> and um, I tried to cover a lot of little fragments of that piece. So hopefully we can do maybe uh, another part, uh, another part of the series. Maybe talk about the Christian period because it's a fascinating period, specifically in Petra. Uh, uh, to give you a little taste of that, it's... There are very good indications that the Nabataeans may have been some of the people to convert to Christianity earlier than a lot of other people in the region when it was still illegal to do so.
So that I always have found fascinating. And again, I had it in this presentation. And I, when I ran a test run earlier today, I'm like, oh, we got to cut some stuff because <laughs> we'd be here for two hours. Um, and as it was, I felt like I rushed through the material today to, to fit it into an hour. So I hope it wasn't too no, overwhelming. Right. That too was much. wonderful. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank my colleagues at ASA for arranging this and making it happen. But thank you all for joining us today. Bye bye. Have a great thank weekend, you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, ASA.